Hi, I'm Susan Gill. I'm with the Ask Resource Center. We are going to start our host home webinar. Thank you for joining. Um, I may repeat a couple of people that have registered and haven't gotten online yet. But they can always listen to us later. Uh, this is our host home web webinar. I'm Susan Gill. I'm facilitating it for Ask Resource Center. Um, Casey Belzen is a host home coordinator with Mosaic in Central Iowa. She will be um, talking to us about host homes. Daryl Leffler, a host home provider, will be visiting with us and sharing his story. And Kari Paulson, whose son lives in a host home, will be sharing her story also. I just want to share with everyone that we are not um, trying to promote uh, one agency more so than another. Um, we are going. We are talking about host homes through Mosaic um, because they are locally around the Des Moines area, but statewide um, they are also available. And also, Rim Iowa is available. That's why I have this uh, on the screen here. Their location in Hiawatha, and I have contact information here. Um, and you can just go online um, to RimIowa.com and find out any additional information. So now we're going to start with um, Casey. And as I stated, she is with Employed by Mosaic Iowa. And she's going to tell us uh, a little bit about what Mosaic is and then what a host home is. Thank you, Casey. So to start off a little bit telling you about Mosaic, um, we are an agency that supports individuals with intellectual disabilities in every area of their life in order to live it to the fullest. Mosaic is a, non, is a Lutheran nonprofit social ministry organization, and we're an organization with, with roots reaching back to 1913 and 1925 with the consolidation of our legacy organizations, Beth Fiji and Martin Luther Homes. We currently serve adults who are over the age of 18 and who qualify for 24-hour supports through the Intellectual Disability Waiver. A host home is just one of the residential service types that Mosaic provides. We also provide um, ICF-ID, which is uh, intermediate care facilities for the intellectually disabled, and we have traditional 24-hour HCBS group home services. Mosaic and Central began providing the service in 2009 after many years of ongoing conversations with Iowa Medicaid, DHS, and legislators. To receive services in a host home, an individual must be an adult with an intellectual disability. They must already be on the ID waiver, and they must also qualify to receive 24-hour supports. The host home provider is responsible for providing the training, supervision, and support as identified in that person's individual service plan. The host home model is typically compared to a foster home setting. It falls under the same rules and regulations as a traditional HCBS group home. Host homes do offer the least restrictive and most natural living environment. Host homes help people achieve the highest degree of life satisfaction and personal goals. Currently, our Des Moines agency supports 49 individuals in the host home setting, and this number does uh, increase each month. Why are host homes a great option? Well, they provide consistency and more focused attention to the individuals receiving services. Um, it is a natural, home-like setting. There's personalized attention on a daily basis. There's a high degree of independence with close supervision for safety and guidance. There's consistent training and support from the same person. And there's regular monitoring for those with health care needs. <clears throat> Some additional ways that host it provides one-on-one -on -one contact between the provider and the family member or guardian. They may live close to family and friends. It's a good choice for transitioning from the family home or a group home. It's less structured lifestyle for older adults, and people consistently report higher life satisfaction rates. In addition, people achieve more of their personal goals.
I'm sorry, I'm having trouble going on here. A little bit slow. Here we're going to talk about Daniel. We're doing fine. But first I want to introduce you to Daryl. He is a host home provider. And Daryl has been involved in the lives of individuals with disabilities both personally and professionally since the early 80s. He and his wife Kathy live in Urbandale and their family includes two sons two daughter-in-laws and one granddaughter right now, three on the way. <laughs> Their daughter Kaylee lives at the Knapp House of Hope in West Des Moines, one of the medically based group homes operated by Mainstream Living. Daryl has a BS in Business Administration from Northwest Missouri State University and for many years worked in management positions both in the hospitality and insurance industries. Ten years ago he chose to follow a new career path and has been professionally invested in serving and advocating for individuals and families in the disability community. He was a case manager at ChildServe for several years and now considers himself semi-retired, currently being employed by Mosaic as a host home provider. Daryl's hobbies and interests have always centered around family and church activities. He wholeheartedly embraced his more recent role of grappa. He and Kathy attend um, Lutheran Church of Hope in West Des Moines. Daryl is honored to be of service to the people in the disability community. And now Daryl is going to share his story about he and Daniel. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I am honored to um, be able to um, do this host home program, and I'm very honored that Daniel's living with my wife and I. Um, um, Kathy and I first heard about this program um, when I was a case manager. One of the clients on my caseload um, was a host home, so I was able to watch that um, relationship develop, and I was so impressed with it and just felt it was a good fit for my wife and I and our family. So. I explored further into it and became a host home provider. It will be three years in August. The picture you're looking at right now is my family. Um, we took this last October. It shows that I have five children. David is my oldest. He's a music teacher in Irvindale. Um, his wife is right next to him, April. Um, she's a x-ray tech at Mercy Hospital. And that's my beautiful granddaughter, Violet. <laughs> and then I'm next in line there, and my wife, Kathy. And then it shows my daughter-in-law, Jen. She's sitting down. She's a nurse, and they live in Manning. I'm married to my son, Kevin. Kevin is an Iowa State trooper. Um, they both live in Manning, and they're expecting their first child um, in April. Um, Jen is a nurse. She's got her social, um, master's degree and um, he currently is instructing other nurses. Um, um, behind Jen is my youngest daughter, Lizzie. Um, we, Kathy and I, had three biological children and then we ended up adopting two additional children through the foster care program. And Lizzie's the youngest member of our family. She's now 19 and and um, is also expecting a child. Um, then you see our daughter Katie, she's in the wheelchair. She's our third biological child and she was born at 24 weeks and was a miracle baby. She was the first 24 week baby that survived at Mercy Hospital. Immediately behind her is Kevin, he's an Iowa State Trooper. He's the person in our family that's a card, he's so hilarious. Um, and there's not a stranger, there's no strangers with Kevin. He can talk to anyone. Um, then to the far right is Corey. She, we also adopted her. Corey um, has autism and is doing very well. My wife and I provide informal supports. She lives in an apartment and she has a part-time job. Um, we're very proud of her accomplishments. So that's my family. <laughs> and... Um, um, Daniel joined us, like I said before, it will be two, three years in August, and, and we just really include him in our family. Um, this picture right here was a snapshot of when we were at a, a zoo. I think it was um, Blank Park Zoo. Um, it was one of those selfie 
sticks and and as you can see Daniel just really <laughs> blends right in with our family um, um, we we um, include him in all of our family gatherings holiday meals um, um, everything now he he has a family close by and every three weekends he goes for an overnight stay with his parents and sees his siblings on a regular basis um, and and then for holidays he he um, goes and spends holidays with his family as well too. So Daniel is lucky in that he gets to celebrate holidays twice every year for each occasion. Um, and he appears to enjoy both with us and with um, his family. Here's a picture, a snapshot of um, part of my family. We, I graduated from Northwest Missouri State University in Missouri and we go back for homecoming nearly every year while well, Daniel came with us and he enjoyed the parade, he enjoyed this visiting with our friends down there and he was just a very much very much a part of it. Um, go ahead. Um, this snapshot here is um, Daniel loves to go fishing and camping um, and this is just a picture of one weekend we were at Sailorville and and um, we were sitting around the fire, just visiting and, and having a relaxing weekend um, camping. Daniel loves bumper cars. And <laughs> this snapshot is when he was at um, Adventureland. Um, he, on that day, I think we went through that line three or four times. Um, he did do other things at Adventureland, but um, he certainly had a blast going there. And, um, as you can see, I think I snapped that picture, and as soon as I snapped it, he hit me. <laughs> so, so with the bumper car. With the bumper car. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Daniel, Daniel loves Adventureland. He loves going to the zoo. He loves going to the science center. He loves going to Living History Farms. Um, he does a lot of um, social community outings with us. We take Daniel on vacation with us, and this snapshot is, I believe, the zoo. It's either in Omaha or Kansas City, but um, he likes to go on short weekend vacation trips with us, and he loves staying in the motel. Um, he loves the swimming pool and just loves being included in um, vacation plans. We've made two trips to the Black Hills. Um, one a couple years ago and then one just a few weeks ago and he thoroughly enjoys just going with Kathy and I. This is a snapshot of um, a Thanksgiving dinner at our house when we lived in Johnston. Um, it just shows everyone's around the table. There's quite a few of us, 12 to 14 as we gather and Daniel's just a part of it. This one is a gathering where we actually went to a restaurant and as you can see, my granddaughter's right there <laughs> looking back at the picture, too. Now, on a monthly basis, Daniel likes to entertain, um, and I'm work my wife and I are working with him on hosting um, parties at our house, and Daniel's really good. He has mastered doing chili from scratch, and he does brownies for dessert, and um, what he does is when he invites people over, whether it be family, now this is a um, a sibling that is here, but um, he really enjoys cooking for them and and just playing that host and having that host responsibility. He also has a lot of opportunities there. We try to have a party at our home about once a month where he invites peers and friends over and then um, we'll have game night. It, uh, we'll play the Wii if the weather's bad outside. If the weather's nice outside, we'll go outside and we'll play yard games. Um, Daniel likes to, Daniel is very social and we give him a lot of opportunities to be social. <laughs> right here's the picture. Um, I will have to admit there are times when our granddaughter comes over and and Kathy and I are greeting our granddaughter and she runs right up to Daniel <laughs> and grabs his leg and hugs his leg, you know. She doesn't know anything different. Daniel's always been a part of our family and, and she has a special relationship with Daniel. Daniel cooks. He um, does a really good job. Um, here he's frying meat on the stove. At one time Daniel has anxiety challenges and 
was afraid of heat and stove and everything. Now he's he's frying the hamburger and he does chili from start to finish. He does all the different steps and he's really built his confidence. Here, baking, baking. baking yeah, brownies. He loves making brownies mm. for various reasons. Um, he also does road cinnamon rolls. He puts them out and frosts them. Um, my wife and I are trying to teach him or support um, values, um, faith values. Um, and his parents and, and us are very similar with our faith values. And we believe in giving back. And Danielle is really good at participating with my wife and I. Um, several times now we've baked 10 dozen cinnamon rolls and have brought them to church events. Um, Mosaic has this um, give back or uh, thanking um, churches for their involvement with Mosaic. And, and twice now we've baked 10 pans of cinnamon rolls and Daniel's right in there helping me do it. And um, he takes pride in giving back. So this is a value we, which is very important to us. Here, Daniel has a hobby of um, creating giant Jenga game sets. Now, Daniel made this set, and this one too, we, we actually, it's his hobby. He, we work together, my son volunteers and spends time with my son, and um, my son and Daniel and I go out in the garage and we cut down these two by threes and into segments, and then we, um, Daniel sands them, and he just loves doing this. He sings jingles and listens to Christian music as we're working away in our basement shop, and, and then he's gotten to the point, at first he just wanted to sand, but now he also um, stains and seals them too, and then we sell them at craft shows. Here's a craft show at Christmas time um, at Child Serve. Um, I think during the Christmas season we sold eight to ten sets. I can't remember for sure, but now we're we're um, we've got quite a supply in our basement. Um, we're stocking up. We're trying to create an inventory, and we'll be going to probably the farmers market mm -hmm. in Johnston and selling it. Yes. It's a social opportunity for Daniel. He loved that day. He just loved being there, seeing people. Um, so now Daniel, it gives Daniel. It's a hobby, but it's it's a way for him to earn money as well, too, and he makes really good money doing this process. Um, Daniel is really good at chipping in and doing chores. Now, this was his swing set, and um, he every year would help um, stain it or varnish it or whatever the process is. Um, Daniel loves doing other chores, too. He loves picking up sticks, and we used to live in a townhome association. Daniel was known by everyone in the townhome association that he picked up all the sticks, and that was a preferred fun activity for him. He was motivated because then we would burn the sticks in the campfire, and he loved watching that. But um, again, that was an opportunity for him to give back to his community. And now that we live in Irvingdale, already we picked up the sticks not only in our backyard, but neighbors on both sides too. Daniel just loves doing things for other people, and of course we encourage that. This is um, a picture of, we visited Jester Park Stables, and Daniel had an opportunity to comb a horse. Um, and um, what my wife and I are finding out, we start these opportunities for him. Some of them he really embraces, and some of them he doesn't, but we keep on trying to introduce new opportunities for him. Um, he did, hasn't gone back there, um, but we're still working on that because we really think he would benefit from that. Fishing. Oh my gosh, Daniel, he just wants to fish all the time. We have this pond is located in our backyard right now, and, and he would fish every day if possible. Um, already this season we've gone several times and just last night we were fishing and caught about four fish. He thoroughly loves fishing. He loves taking the fish off the hook and um, doesn't like putting the worm on the hook. I do that and then he takes the fish off for me. Here um, is a picture of when he caught that bass. He's very proud of it. In the background is a picture of a volunteer companion that is a program um, through Mosaic. Um, this individual here visits Daniel about once a week and they go fishing during the summertime. During the winter they play Wii games and ping pong in our basement. 
Um, it's just a volunteer opportunity. Um, and since this picture, my son David is also a volunteer now through Mosaic and can spend time with Daniel, taking him out into the community doing fun things. Um, I think this is the last picture of Daniel. Um, this is just a picture of how he loves to go into motel swimming pools. Um, I don't, I'm not exactly sure. He, he's, <laughs> every time we go camp, uh, going, going someplace, we stay in a motel and he loves going in the pool as long as no one else is in there and then he likes walking around and splashing, but he doesn't care if there's kids in the pool or then he won't go in because he doesn't want to be splashed, but he should like splashing other people. He has a fun time. He's, so I, I don't know if there's anything specific you want me to cover, but Daniel's very busy. He has a very busy schedule. He does well keeping busy. He doesn't do very well with downtime. Um, he has a lot of challenges. When he first moved in with us, there was a, a lot of um, verbal and physical aggression. Um, but with the stability of just getting to know Kathy and I better in our relaxed atmosphere at home, um, he's doing really good. He hasn't had any challenge or any acting out of any aggressive verbal or physical behaviors for over two years now. Can you share with me during the day, are you with him 24-7, Monday through Friday, or does he have some activities he goes to during the day? I'm a firm believer um, that host home providers, they need a break too. Um, and by giving them a break, they can be better, just like parents. Parents need a break too. Um, Daniel goes to a day half program at REM three days a week on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 9 to 3. Um, and then on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays, we work on his hobby of creating those giant Jenga game sets. Um, also, those are the days where we go out in the community doing fun other things, too. Um, but yes, he does go to REM um, three days a week. And then every third weekend, he goes and visits his parents um, for the weekend, which also gives my wife and I a break. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing. And I'm sure there will be questions for you. We are going to wait until the end of the um, webinar to, to talk about questions or okay. to take questions. And now I'm going to introduce Kari Paulson. She is, um, her and her husband Kent are parents of Jordan Paulson who resides in a host home and has for one year, I think she even said it was one year ago yesterday, tomorrow. tomorrow. He is the youngest of four adult children and all, all who have graduated from Urbandale High School. Kari works at um, Heartland Area Education Agency as a parent and educator coordinator for 17 years. The districts she shares and she serves are Urbandale, Ankeny, and Saydale. And she also shares West Des Moines and Johnson with Sue Becker. And take it away, Kari. Well, Jordan is the youngest of four uh, boys, my husband and I uh, have, uh, our eldest son is 35, he lives in Arizona with his wife, and they, um, he is a sergeant with the Maricopa Police Department down there, um, and then we also, and they have two daughters uh, who are nine and seven. We have Joe and Nikki, who is, they're in the middle. Uh, they're holding Nate, our grandson. He is, uh, Joe is 33 years old. Uh, he and Nikki have uh, been married for going on five years, and they have a little, that little guy named Nate, who is the light of our life right now. He keeps everybody on their toes, and that is the, uh, uh, Joe is where Jordan is now living. Joe is the host home provider for Jordan. He and his wife, of course, do that together, but Joe is the primary. Uh, then the next one over in the light blue is Justin. He is 27, and he is working full-time for Candeo as a uh, job support um, job uh, coach uh, and also is in grad school for vocational rehabilitation in, at Drake. And he's in, just finishing his first year there. He, he's going straight through, and he I hardly see him. He's busy. And, of course, at the end is, is Jordan and then my husband and I, and then our two granddaughters, Mackenzie and Aubrey, who are nine and seven. 
Joe, I'll, I'll just kind of start talking about, uh, we found out about the program, um, and from the beginning of finding out, which Daryl is the one who told me about it, he knew my family, and he especially knew that Joe had worked with Jordan quite a bit doing different things in the community and respite for us. And Joe also works in the area of uh, being an associate, special education associate at, for Johnston Schools. So Joe has quite a bit of experience in working with people with disabilities because he did not only worked with Jordan, he's worked with other kids through um, different agencies and CCO. So uh, the, when I found out about this uh, program, it was kind of shocking to me that this could actually maybe work. Um, I really hadn't considered Joe Jordan moving out till he was probably 25 or 30. And when I found out about this program, I approached my husband who was a little bit leery about it. He, I think he missed it, kind of misses him more than I do. I hate to say that, but I think he does. And um, so we kind of had a discussion with Joe. We discussed, of course, with his wife. We gave some time to put thought, and then we, um, Joe, I believe, contacted Mosaic, and I did too, to let them know that we were interested in, in doing this. So we came into the program already having somebody that we wanted to be the provider for Jordan. Um, and we did have to file an exception to policy through the ID waiver. Our case manager did that, and as well as Mosaic. And we were approved for Jordan. And not everyone has um, a sibling that is going to be able to do this sort of thing, and we were just fortunate enough to have Joe happy and willing to do it. They also um, have their little guy who is now going to be two, and that was an opportunity because Joe does work full time for Nikki to be able to be home with, with Nate, and it's been a joy watching the relationship between Jordan and Nate blossom. It's been a lot of fun. Jordan is working on many goals in the home. Um, they, he works on, of course, making his favorite peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And one thing that he tends to do is pile on the peanut butter and jelly. So Joe has had to really work with him because we were kind of getting a little worn out being parents and having children, so, you know, for 30 some years in our home. We, I could see that I wasn't following through on a lot of things that I should be following through on as far as his behaviors. So I felt like this might, you know, be a good reason to have him with Joe, because Joe really is, he does things in a great way as far as redirecting Jordan. Yes, they had more behaviors initially. Um, that's to be expected with any transition, but that has really, really settled down. Here he is making his PBJ again. Another opportunity for him to work on a goal is laundry. And uh, he seems to kind of enjoy doing the laundry. And you know, when I was, he was at home with me, that was, he wouldn't ever have been agreeable to doing laundry. And he, Joe's been working with him on that and he's doing really a good job. That's Nate now, that picture was just taken. And Joe, Joe is, uh, caregiver for, for Nate and Jordan, and as well as his wife, and it's just been a, a really good fit. This was taken, um, we had a, a family outing at an indoor water park, and uh, the, our oldest son and his wife and our granddaughters uh, were all there, and the whole family came, and it was a great, great experience. Um, this, is, this is Joe, Nikki, Nate, and Jordan, and in the background is our other daughter-in-law. This is the night to shine. Jordan is a highly social kid, so he's always wanting to know when the next big event is going to be. And he has something almost weekly, um, at, if not twice weekly. He's uh, involved in the Sound Ridge Choir. He does Fuse events. He does, uh, there's a new group forming at Valley Church that he's going to start to go to every other month. He's in Special Olympics through Challenger and Mosaic, basketball and bowling. He works out at the gym with his brother um, about two or three days a week. And he has, of course, teen night, which Joe and Nikki pays out of pocket for him to go, um, or with Jordan's extra money from Social Security, so that he's able to still attend that, because that was really important to him, too. Um, Joe, you mean they have to pay for it? 
they pay pri privately for him to attend teen night at child service because all of the SCL and respite time is given for the salary of the host home provider. So therefore, but Jordan, that's important to him. Jordan also goes to Camp Courageous for a week every summer. And Joe and Nikki don't get paid for that week, but they private pay for Camp Courageous to take him because they know that's important to him. So we're trying to keep some semblance of um, a structure that he's gotten used to. He's, a, he's attended Camp Courageous for probably going on six years now, and that is something that he looks forward to. And we have him going this year again, too. So he um, has lots of social opportunities. He also has a booth at the Johnston Farmers Market. It's uh, called JP's Refreshments and More. And he, Joe, works with them. Um, that's another one of the, the goals we have for him is, is with money and appropriate interaction. And he requires quite a bit of support, but it's something, again, that he really looks forward to. And here he is with, can I say anything? Kaylee Gill. Um, Kaylee sells, well, has sold in the past eggs from her um, chickens and they go over really well. In fact, I always want to get some and they're usually gone before I can get some. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. And Jordan is highly musical. He loves music. That's kind of his hobby. He likes to play on his Casio. We actually, when he moved into Joe and Nikki's place, we kind of upgraded his piano, and uh, I think he likes to spend quite a bit of time doing that when he's in his downtime. During the day, Jordan does attend a program at Link Associates called VIP. It is a pro program that is for volunteering. And Jordan is one of those that would probably, for the day habilitation, he likes to get out and be in the community, I think, more than anything. So trying to find a, a, a program after high school for him proved to be a little bit uh, challenging. And I was very appreciative that uh, Nikki was actually home because he did have some days that he was at home. And he just started this program, well, I'd say right after the first of the year. And he goes out in the community twi uh, to two different sites to volunteer. Many of them are um, like Meals for the Heartland, and um, uh, he goes to Yes and volunteers at Yes. And he does, like I said, he goes to two different sites um, a day. So he gets a lot of interaction with people, and that makes him happy. You had mentioned the Restore, the Restore. and the Blank Zoo, and um, St. Vincent. St. Vincent, Paul, yeah. He does, I mean, they, it does change a little bit too, but typically it, I think they try to get a, keep them in that routine because they know what's expected. Because as you know, for a lot of our kids, routine and structure is highly important for them, and it is for Jordan too. Speaking of routine, can you tell me how often he comes to visit you at home? We have him every Sunday, and that works really well because there, there again, it's routine and structure for him, and we get to see him for sure once a week. Many times, Joe and Nikki and Nate will come over for dinner or do something like that. So we do probably see him a little bit more than that. Um, we vacation every other year as a family. So, of course, Jordan is, is it's easy for us because he's right, he'd be with us either way. So, great. And it's kind of nice because now we go out on vacation and I'm not the only one taking care of him um, or can't. Uh, it's Joe and Nikki. It's, it's all of us kind of doing and doing that. So it's kind of, it's make sure vacation, really a vacation. <laughs> um, now we are going to um, talk about the process, the referral process a little bit. And don't forget, you can um, type your questions in um, and we will answer them when, we, when we're through talking about the referral process. So we're going to have Cassie explain that to us. Yeah, so to talk a little bit about how the referral process works, um, Jen Zajcek is our associate director. Um, so she completes an initial screening with any of the individuals that are looking to receive um, any of our services from Mosaic. Um, her contact information will be available at the end. 
uh, that initial meeting is used to determine what uh, the ideal service type is for each person um, and talking about those options. If the person, if the, uh, the family or the client and service is looking to receive the host home services, then I would um, also set up a time to meet with the person. And um, I need to correct myself. I said Cassie <laughs> instead of Casey. It is Casey. I just want to clarify that. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I will meet with the individual in order to determine um, kind of what they're looking for in a potential host home provider um, and learning a little bit more about the person. And then um, that's where that process kind of starts. Unfortunately, there is no guarantee um, if or when a client match will be made. Um, our host home selections are based upon preferences, needs, and desires of uh, each the individual, the host family, um, and any, anybody else on the team. Um, there are many factors that come, come into play into this decision. Some of those could be like the location of the host home provider's home, the experience of the host home provider, uh, personality match, communication style, um, age or gender of the host home provider, uh, if there's children in the home, that might be a factor, um, any recreational preferences or family dynamics. So when Mosaic feels that there may be a good match, um, myself as the host home coordinator will contact the potential provider to share some information about the proposed client. Um, if the person is uh, interested in meeting that person, I'll assist in uh, coordinating a time for the client and the family to meet the host home provider. And pending the outcome of that first meeting, additional visits will be scheduled after that time. Um, we really like to take our time during the visit process to make sure that um, you know, there's ample time to build that relationship. Um, so we want to do lots and lots of visits, one-on-one -on -one visits, um, spending time in the community together, spending you know, time at the host home provider's home um, before making any final decisions uh, on whether or not we're going to move forward. Um, if at any point during the process, one of the parties, so that could be the client, their family, or representative, Mosaic, or the host home pr provider feels that it's not a match, um, the process will be stopped and you know, we will look at other options at that time. So we never want the host home provider or the client to feel pressured to make a potential match work. You know, the most important part of the selection process is finding a match that is mutually beneficial to all involved. So once it's been determined that a host home provider and a client match has been made, the team will discuss um, next steps and determine a target move date. Uh, the approval process for funding is obtained through the managed care organization, effective tomorrow, and the associated case manager. Uh, at this point, the approval process can take up to 90 days. Uh, client move cannot take place until that funding piece has been secured. And because of the individuality of this process, the host home provider and client selection is not necessarily first come, first serve. Uh, we do have over 50 people on our waiting list that want to be host home providers, which is a really good problem for us to have. But that also means that um, the wait for the placement can take some time. And again, we just um, it's more important for us to match preferences and what everybody's looking for rather than how long somebody has been waiting. Um, so that's how that works. Um, there are times when people have their own match in mind, kind of like um, Kari's story with Jordan and Joe. Um, so that is an option. Um, in some cases, family members, uh, as long as they're not the guardian or the parent, might be able to provide the services. So um, generally we'll see this as like a biological sibling or sometimes even like an aunt or an uncle. Um, but as Kari explained, there is that exception to policy piece currently that needs to be in place um, that might be changing with the NCOs. We're just not sure on that yet. Um, it is important to know that any client who wishes to receive the 24-hour supports through Mosaic um, including the placement in a host home, must be on the ID waiver. Um, as you begin the application process, be sure to share this information with us. Um, if you are interested in learning more or referring um, somebody to Mosaic, uh, you can contact Jen Zajic. Her uh, contact information is right there. And um, I take care of all the incoming host home provider applications. Um, so if somebody wants to fill out an application, you can uh, give me a call or shoot me an email and I'll get that information to you. Um, or if there's any other questions regarding host homes, I would be happy to answer them. And I want to thank you all for um, 
joining us in our webinar. We're not finished yet, but I do want to take this time to talk to you about a survey that you'll be receiving via email. It will be sent to you at about 1.30 today. If you could complete it, as we are all nonprofit organizations, this is helpful to let us be able to continue and have more webinars down the road on different topics. I do have the link link here for the for the um, survey if you want to write that down or or um, go to it now otherwise it will you be looking for it um, in a little bit later this afternoon um, and now we'd like to know if there's any questions that have been um, submitted it doesn't show that anybody has typed any questions if you want to do that quickly we have a few minutes here um, I do have a couple questions that were sent before. Somebody had wanted to know about the HD waiver, the um, ill and handicap waiver. Um, no, HD, health and, health and disability. disability. Sorry, used to be. sorry, used, used to be. To be. <laughs> um, anyway, the health and disability waiver covered this, and, and I'm sorry to say no, it doesn't. It's only intellectual disabilities. I think there you get into more medical needs, and maybe that you know, it's a different area that at this time they don't do anything with that. And then the out-of-pocket expenses. There aren't out-of-pocket expenses. When Kari was talking, she was talking about how the host home provider does receive money and, um, and that varies with the amount of services that the student, that the child needs or adult needs. Um, because somebody could be pretty much independent and somebody has a lot of needs. So that it would make a difference or whether they have activities during the day or whether they don't. But what Kari was talking about was that they took money to pay for that because they weren't able to, um, it wasn't able to come out of the funds of his waiver because they were receiving the funds for that. And Jordan also receives Social Security, and he does pay rent out of his Social Security. And then he also has some additional funds from that Social Security check monthly for some of his um, desires, I guess, so to speak. Perfect. So, um, he, you know, there it, the money is available for him to do that. And it was an agreed upon, um, so that was agreed upon before they even did the host home because we knew that was important to George. What is the most important support or service that an agency or provider can provide to a host home provider? What is the most important support or service that an agency provider support or service that an agency can provide to the host home provider? Yeah, that's the question. Well, just to answer that from Mosaic's uh, standpoint, we do provide the oversight. Um, of the host home provider and the client. There's um, all kinds of policies and procedures that, that they have to follow. Um, we have four host home managers currently that each carry a caseload. Um, so they do visits to the home at least monthly, sometimes more than that if needed, if there's more support needed. Um, and then we also do one unannounced visit per year, at least one unannounced. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, our managers are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if there's any issues or concerns, um, they will always be able to uh, get a hold of somebody. They also do initial training. Yep. You uh, might want to explain, you know, that you've got that package training. Yep, uh, we do. We have a training curriculum that all of our host home providers are required to go through. Um, we also do very extensive background checks on people before um, placing them on the waiting list. So we check criminal history, we check um, all of the abuse registries, uh, dependent adult abuse, child abuse, uh, sexual abuse. Um, we run motor vehicle record checks. Um, we complete drug testing of the host home providers. Um, and we also do an environmental review of their home to make sure that it's a, a safe uh, and clean environment. But you have to remember to the parent of, or the guardian of the uh, person that's going to be living in the host home um, is going to be going and, and visiting the home and um, more than once. And so it's not like it's a strange environment. So Right, yeah, it's really important. I mean, not only for the host home provider to build that relationship with the client before the final decision is made, but also 
um, any family members that are involved so that there can really be that collaboration and communication. Something else, um, when you initially became a close home provider, um, there's an inspection of the home to make sure that it's a safe environment for the client. Mm -hmm. um, they, they have requirements like for fire extinguishers and smoke detectors and, mm -hmm. and um, um, requirements that um, is reviewed on a monthly basis to make sure that they're within standard to keep that client safe in that home. Now, what's so nice about this is it's a home. It's very personal. It's not like an uh, institution. Um, sometimes, like in a group home setting, you can lose that homey feeling where you really gain that through the host home program. Um, someone coming into our home would never know that we're a host home. I mean, it's just a typical house, you know. Yes, we have those fire extinguishers around, but we try not to make it real obvious, but yeah, we um, provide a safe environment. And there's, I think, daily uh, accountability as far as um, on the computer. I know that they have to sh show progress in goals. And yep, that's that's, absolutely. Yep. Uh, all of our host home providers do um, document. Uh, we have an online system called Therap that we use, so they're uh, required to enter daily documentation that the managers can, you know, look at, you know, at any time to make sure that services are being provided in the way um, that we expect them to be. And there's also a lot of collaboration with uh, case managers um, and other members of the team, whether they attend a day program or work setting or um, anything like that. There's always uh, just lots of communication between team members to make sure that, you know, we're, we're meeting the needs of the person in service. And you shared with me, um, Daryl, that um, you didn't know Daniel before, and you had several visits with him. Can you share a little bit about sure. that? Um, once I sh um, applied with Mosaic for this position, um, actually Daniel was the second client that was a possibility. We um, had a meeting with another client, um, but um, we determined um, that it wouldn't be a good match for us. And then shortly thereafter, um, we were one of the fortunate people that we were matched really quick. And uh, we met this family, and there were several interviews. Um, we talked with the parents. Um, and then once the parents determined that they were interested in this, then the process began where we wanted to make sure that we were compatible and that um, Daniel would feel comfortable with us. So, um, but again, it's in the matching process, but my wife and I like to ride bikes, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not motorcycles, but pedal bikes, you know, and uh, that was an interest of Daniel's too. Um, he had a bike, so, so what we naturally did was he um, brought his bike and um, we had a green belt trail right behind our home and, and we went on bike rides, you know, and that really, um, spiked his interest in us because, wow, you know, he could safely ride his bike on this Greenbelt Trail, be very safe, and um, he loves to go out and meet. I mean, he would go out and meet three times a day if he could, you know. Um, so that was very important. You, you, it would have been hard to have someone who maybe didn't know how to ride a bike or wasn't physically able to. And there's going to be some compromises. Like, mm -hmm. my wife and I are not into going out to eat, you know. It's so expensive, you know. But yet he needs that, you know. So it's been a compromise, and there's not going to be a perfect fit all the time, you know. But there's some compromise, and it's been a good compromise. So, how old is Daniel? Daniel, <laughs> his um, birthday is next week, um, and I think he is turning forty-six. <laughs> He's quite a bit older. Yes. Yeah. Well, developmentally and emotionally, I think his interests are more geared toward a typical five or six year old, okay. you know. Um, but yes, he's in an adult um, body. He's, um, his disability is a very unique, rare disability, 9P minus. There's only a couple hundred in the known mm -hmm. cases. So, and he's one of the older ones, so um, it's really unclear what the prognosis will be long term, but he's doing, my wife and I feel he's just doing great. He, he's just one happy guy, and um, we feel he's doing great, and I think his parents feel the same. So we do have another question that 
you and your family have done so much for Daniel. How does that impact your family? Well, that, that's an interesting conversation. Like I said before, every three weeks he does go home. Um, and there are times when, when my family gathers, you know, um, if I've got Daniel there, he requires my attention, you know, um, and it kind of takes away from I being able to totally function on my kids, and I think you understand well, that. Well, they have yeah. a two-year-old, too, so <laughs> yeah. their, their focus is never on us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, so... So, but but it's a good mix. I mean, I think we figured that out sometimes, like for Easter, he might have a Easter dinner with my whole family of 14, you know, and then he'll also have it with his family, you know. He always celebrates holidays with his family, and um, we always celebrate before because we've got married adult children, so we, in, in our personal life, have chosen to celebrate the holidays before the holiday. Um, so that we can all gather. And sometimes Daniel's there and sometimes he's not, you know. Um, so I hope that answers your yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess, and the question was in Jordan too, but. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, initially when I talked to our other kids about this, the, the two other are, one of them was like, well, why didn't you ask me? And I said, because you're not married, because you're still in college, because eventually you'll be his guardian. So that's why. But it wasn't. It was almost like they were a little bit. <laughs> why didn't you ask me? Mm. Um, the oldest one lives in in Arizona, so it was never a big factor. You know, he's been away from home for a number of years and has his own life, so um, that was never a factor for him. But really, when you think about it, your son that question, why not him? Even though he's not as settled and married and so forth. He had done a lot of working with him growing up. Yes. I mean, he, and I um, think he really he enjoyed. He had also done some respite and SEL for Jordan, and he uh, worked in the field of, of doing that for many other kids, either through Child Serve or Respite Connection or CCO. And he is going into the field. It's just a different area. aspect of it. Yeah. I think that's all for our questions. Um, I do, we do want to share with you, there is a video, if you go to mosaicinfo.org, there is a um, video there about host homes, but uh, Casey wanted to explain a little bit about how this video is for Mosaic uh, nationwide. Yep, so this video, um, if you watch that, it was developed by our national organization, which um, is located in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, they show host home settings in different states where there are multiple individuals served in the same host home. Um, but here in Iowa, we only serve one client in each host home. Um, that way we can ensure that that one-on-one -on -one, um, supervision and consistency, and we just feel that that's the best, best practice for us right now. And I did see on the REM Iowa site, they do also a video. Actually, to tell you the truth, I hadn't looked at it either. but. Um, that's just another one in case you want to check that out. Um, oh, and you might want to, if you don't get this written down anymore, you could just Google Mosaic um, Host Homes and it'll, you'll come to it. Um, but we want to thank you here at Ask. I'm going to check real quick to see if we have any more questions that are typed in. Okay. And um, as, so as far as I know, we don't have any more questions. Feel free to call ASK 800-450-8667 um, if you have any questions. We can refer you to Mosaic, uh, Rim, um, and Daryl or Kari would be welcome to answer any questions later that you might have. But thank you for um, attending, and please answer that survey. That really helps us a lot.